All right, well, thank you very much, David. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today um, about some of the latest research that we've been doing with regards to the role of the cardiomyocyte clock. So since I'm the first speaker, I thought that I would just remind everybody that there are marked time of day dependent oscillations in both cardiovascular physiology as well as pathophysiology. So associated with an increase in blood pressure and heart rate in the early hours of the morning, there is a dramatic increase in your, uh, oops, I apologize. There's a dramatic increase in the risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, arrhythmias, and also sudden cardiac death. Now classically, these rhythms have been attributed to factors that are outside of the, cardio, uh, outside of the cardiovascular system, such as oscillations in sympathetic, adrenergic, and autonomic uh, stimulation alterations in uh, physical activity that occur on a daily basis and associated alterations in vascular resistance. Uh, we, of course, don't graze all the time, so we have feeding and fasting cycles, and that is associated with various neurohumeral oscillations that also occur over the course of the day. And all of these factors can impinge on cardiovascular function. But what you're going to hear about quite a bit today is that there are these cell autonomous molecular mechanisms known as circadian clocks that are, have the capacity to alter organ function in a time of day dependent manner. Now these clocks are found within all cells within the body and at the heart of this transcriptionally based mechanism are two transcription factors, clock and BMAL1 that upon heterodimerization they're able to bind to EBOXs and target genes and induce those genes. Now, some of those genes are actual clock components themselves and make up negative feedback loops of the circadian clock mechanism. Shown here are the period and cryptochromes make up one negative feedback loop, and reverb alpha makes up another negative feedback loop. This whole mechanism takes approximately 24 hours to occur, and the way in which it's able to alter cellular function in a time of day dependent manner is by also influencing the expression of non clock controlled genes. Is shown here, clock and BMAL1 can also bind to what are known as clock control genes, which in turn are going to change a whole host of processes over the course of the day. So what we decided to do several years ago was to try and characterize this mechanism in the heart. First of all, we looked at oscillations and expression in intact hearts of a positive loop component, BMAL1, and a negative loop component, PER2, and you can see that they're antiphase to one another. In addition, shown in red, you can see a classic clock output gene, DBP, is also oscillating quite dramatically, 20-fold over the course of the day um, in the heart. But that doesn't really show the cell autonomous uh, nature of this mechanism. So what we did was we isolated cardiomyocytes, we synchronized them in culture with a little bit of serum uh, for a few hours, and then we looked over the next three days at oscillations in these clock genes. You can see here that over those th that three day period, if you focus in on DBP, you can see these nice 24 hour oscillations that persist. And the timing is identical to that seen in vivo in that BMAL1 is peaking about 12 hours before DBP, which peaks just before PER2. So at this point, we were pretty happy in saying that there was indeed a cardiomyocyte clock. But what is it doing? What's its role in the heart? So what we decided to do was, like every, a lot of uh, people have this strategy, you simply you knock something out in, in a rodent model, and then you can try and figure out what its physiologic role is. So we generated two models um, in which we targeted this central heterodimer, this clock BMO1 heterodimer. The first model, known as CCM, targets clock in that we overexpress, specifically in cardiomyocytes, a dominant negative clock mutant protein. In the second model, CBK, we used a Crelock strategy to knock out BMAL1 only in cardiomyocytes. So both models are cardiomyocyte specific, and such feeding behavior and physical activity is completely normal in these animals. The clock is uh, devoid only in the cardiomyocytes. So here I'm showing this clock output gene again, DBP. As you can see in both models, CCM and CBK, you see this dramatic attenuation in the oscillations of this output gene. It's not completely gone, and we believe that's because there are other cell types within an intact heart that still have an intact um, clock, such as endothelial cells, vascular muscle cells, and also fibroblasts. 
So what is it doing in terms of cardiac function? So over the last few years, we've been characterizing these animals in a number of ways. And, and here I'm just going to show you at first the CCM model data. So we've looked in vivo, ex vivo, and isolated perfused working mouse hearts, as well as uh, Tammy Martino in the audience has helped us with in vitro analysis. So through telemetry, you can see uh, these beautiful oscillations in heart rate over the course of the day. And it's here to remind you, of course, that rodents are nocturnal, and therefore they're more active during the dark phase. And that's when you see greater uh, heart rate. When you perform telemetry in the CCM uh, model, you see that these oscillations are attenuated, and these animals have bradycardia. When we go ex vivo to remove acute neurohumeral influences, and this is in a working mouse heart, you can see even ex vivo, these oscillations in cardiac output persist in a wild type heart, and they're completely lost when you get rid of the clock in the heart. And what Tammy showed was that when you look at myosin ATPase activity over the course of the day in a wild type heart, beautiful oscillations, again, higher during the active period, and those oscillations are lost in the CCM model. Okay, so since these were transcription factors that we genetically modified, and this is a transcriptionally based mechanism, we thought that it was reasonable to then perform a microarray approach to identify those genes that are regulated by the clock. That might in turn give us some information about what processes are regulated by this mechanism. So we invested in 120 microarrays. It was a big investment in which we isolated hearts from wild type animals and CCM and wild type and CBK models at different times of the day. So these are three hour intervals, as you'll see here. You can see in wild type hearts these beautiful patterns, these oscillations in expression that you see in those genes over the course of the day that are completely lost in hearts from CCM and CBK mice. And in fact, using this analysis, we've estimated that between 5 to 10 percent of the cardiac transcriptome is regulated either directly or indirectly by the cardiomyocyte clock. When we perform gene ontology analysis, we find that the clock is regulating a whole host of processes, at least at the transcriptional level, and the top four being signal transduction, metabolism, transport, including ion transport, as well as transcription. So based on all of this data, you could envision a model in which this endogenous or the cell autonomous mechanism, the circadian clock, is driving over the course of the day these clock control genes. And if those clock control genes lead to reciprocal changes in the protein levels, that in turn would lead to changes in signaling, metabolism, and electrophysiology over the course of the day, all of which, of course, could then be contributing to changes in contractility of the heart that I showed you before. So what I'm going to talk about today, we've actually looked at all of these, and these are active projects right now for the signaling and electrophysiology. What I'm going to show today, though, is the clock control of metabolism, and that's really what I'm going to focus on. Now, it's a long way to go from changes in mRNA to alterations in metabolic flux that ultimately, lead, uh, ultimately affect cardiac contractility. You have to have reciprocal changes in the protein levels, then you have these proteins can undergo post-translational modifications over the course of the day. The enzymes in the metabolic pathway can undergo allosteric regulation by various metabolites, and so on and so forth, such that we have a long distance and we have to consider a lot of different parameters in order for changes in gene expression to lead to changes in flux. So what we decided to do is we decided to now make a big jump from those gene expression changes all the way to metabolic flux, using a tracer methodology in an isolated perfused heart, as shown here on the left. And what we've done over the years is we've interrogated fatty acid, carbohydrate, ketone body, and also amino acid metabolism, because as we heard earlier this morning from uh, Lisa Heather, that um, the heart is a metabolic omnivore and is able to metabolize all these different fuels. So first of all, I'm going to go into what we found with the glucose tracer studies. Just to remind you that glucose can enter the cell, can be incorporated and stored as glycogen, can pass down glycolysis, and can be fully oxidized uh, via the mitochondria. So when we isolate hearts at different times of the day from wild-type animals and also the CCM animals, 
And we also clamp function in these studies. So all the hearts have the same contractility. What we find is that wild type hearts for glycolysis, glycogen synthesis, and also the oxidation of the glucose, they all have an oscillation with greatest levels during the middle of the active period, a time at which these hearts would normally in vivo be more active and therefore have greatest energetic demand. And when you get rid of the clock in the heart in the CCM model here, you can see that it's completely flatlined, showing that it really is the cardiomyocyte clock that are driving these oscillations. So what we did next was we said, okay, well, let's have a look in our other model, because I don't want this to be model specific. Let's have a look in the CBK model. And let's just look now in the middle of the active period at ZT18 when we see the biggest differences. We also decided to eliminate the potential contribution of feeding fasting cycles by having both fed, oops, I apologize, by having both uh, fed and fasted animals in this analysis. When we do that, we find that in CBK hearts, glycolysis, glycogen synthesis, and glucose oxidation are all depressed in CBK hearts, similar to what we saw in the CCM hearts, and this is independent of the feeding fasting uh, status. Okay, let's move on to fatty acid metabolism. What we find here is, of course, that fatty acids, they can enter the cell, they can be incorporated into triglyceride, they can also go into other things such as phospholipids, or it could be fully oxidized via um, the mitochondria. When we looked at oleate oxidation, uh, fatty acid oxidation, we were a little disappointed. There was a quite pathetic oscillation. Um, it's only uh, slightly higher and not significantly higher at the beginning of the active period. But there was a genotype effect, and you can see here that there's an, about a 10 to 15 percent increase in fatty acid oxidation in the CCM hearts. In contrast, we see this beautiful oscillation uh, in triglyceride synthesis in wild-type hearts, and which is completely lost in the CCM hearts. So it really is driven by the cardiomyocyte clock. And it seems that the clock is driving greater triglyceride synthesis at the end of the active period. When we go on to look at uh, these parameters in the CBK model, for oleate oxidation, again, we see in our second model that there's just greater rates of fatty acid oxidation, similar to what you saw with the CCM model, independent of feeding fasting status. And unfortunately, I don't have data for triglyceride synthesis right now, and I really need to get that data uh, in order to uh, convince you that these oscillations are not model specific. Okay. What about amino acid metabolism? Here I'm actually going, we, we have looked at amino acid oxidation. The heart will burn amino acids, especially things like leucine, branch chain amino acids. But what I'm gonna show you here is the non-oxidative metabolism of amino acids. In particular, we're really getting interested in protein turnover, the uh, rates of translation versus protein degradation through autophagy and the proteasome. So for protein synthesis, first of all, we used the flooding dose model in vivo. So we actually injected animals with radio-labeled phenylalanine. And we noticed that protein synthesis was greatest during the light phase, during the sleep phase, and lower during the dark phase. That was a little surprising to us because during the active period, amino acids and insulin and blood pressure are all elevated. And those things should be promoting protein synthesis. But for whatever reason, Instead, you see protein synthesis is greatest during the sleep phase. And this is, this is actually exacerbated or um, augmented when you investigate this ex vivo by removing acute neurohumeral influences. You can again see this nice oscillation in protein synthesis greatest at the beginning of the sleep phase. We started to investigate the potential role of the clock. Here I'm just showing you uh, CBK hearts at one time of the day. This was ZT6. And you can see that protein synthesis is elevated in those hearts. Um, I'm hoping soon, and maybe in the next few months, we will have a full-time course to see whether those oscillations are completely lost in CBK hearts. When we look at autophagy, we find that autophagy, just like protein synthesis, is actually elevated at the beginning of the sleep phase. And when you look at the activation of autophagy through an acute fast, this is a six-hour fast, you find that there's a three-fold oscillation in wild-type hearts and autophagy activation that's completely lost in CBK hearts, showing that the clock is really driving these oscillations in autophagy. We've also started to look at the proteasome activity, 
again, when we just compare two time points, this is the beginning of the sleep phase versus the beginning of the awake phase, you find that there's greater proteasome activity at the beginning of the sleep phase, and that when you get rid of the clock in the heart, you completely lose those oscillations. So here's just a summary of what I've shown you so far. That oxidative metabolism in the heart, which is being driven by the cardiomyocyte clock, is greatest at the beginning to the middle of the, um, the active period, and this is particularly true for glucose oxidation. Instead, you find that nutrient storage is peaking towards the end of the active period, and that the turnover of proteins, growth and repair, seems to be greatest at the beginning of the sleep phase. Well, hopefully this might make sense physiologically. So when an animal wakes up and it initially has to forage for food, it also has to avoid predation, there's an increased energetic demand on the heart. The heart has to work harder. And therefore, it needs more oxidative metabolism in order to meet that energetic demand. If the animal is successful in its forage for food, it might take the food back to its den and would consume that food and want to then um, store those excess nutrients in anticipation of the upcoming fasting period during the sleep phase. And then during the sleep phase, there's this decreased energetic demand. And therefore, at that time, you can use energy to get rid of damaged proteins and instead replace them with new proteins. So at this stage, you may be wondering, so what? What does it mean? I don't care. And so we feel the same way. I mean, we do care, actually. But, uh, but we think this is important. But now we're trying to address additional questions that are probably in also in your mind. And those are, what are some of the molecular links between the cardiomyocyte clock and these oscillations in metabolism? Do these oscillations in metabolism, do they really drive oscillations in contractile function of the heart? And also, are there any pathologic consequences of having these oscillations? Or, if you disrupt the oscillations, say in shift work, does that contribute towards heart disease? What I wanted to show you at the very end of this talk is an example in which we think there are pathologic consequences, not necessarily of the disruption of these, of these oscillations, but pathologic consequences of actually having these metabolic oscillations. So the concept here is that if you have these oscillations or the temporal partitioning of processes, does that make you more or less susceptible to a particular stress in a time of day dependent manner? So if a stress comes in during the sleep phase, would you perhaps be more susceptible compared to having a sh uh, the same stress during the active period? So sticking with the metabolism theme, I just thought I'd give you one example of something we've been looking at, and that's the stress of fatty acids. Because if the heart is challenged with fatty acids that are in excess of the capacity to either store or oxidize those fatty acids, it can lead to contractile dysfunction of the heart through altered signaling and or lipotoxicity. So here's just a summary of the data that we know to date regarding clock control of fatty acid metabolism. And so far I've already told you, I've shown you data suggesting that the clock is driving triglyceride synthesis at the end of the active period. What I didn't have time to show you is that the clock is also driving an increased capacity to switch on the genes for fatty acid oxidation at the beginning of the active period. So in theory, if you challenge the heart with fatty acids during the active period, the heart can either burn them or can store them as inert triglyceride, and therefore it might not be so bad. In contrast, what I also didn't have time to show you is that during the sleep phase, you get a channeling of fatty acids into phospholipid, diacylglycerol, and also cholesterol ester synthesis, which might be important also for repair of membranes during the sleep period. However, this could lead to altered signaling if you challenge the heart with fatty acids during the sleep phase and in turn could lead to contractile dysfunction. So my last couple of slides are just going to show whether this is true both acutely and or chronically. So here what we did was we challenged hearts with an increasing amount of fatty acids acutely in an ex vivo working mouse, uh, rat heart actually in this case. When you challenge the heart with fatty acids during the active period, there's no contractile dysfunction at all. When you increase the amount of fatty acids in the perfusate during the sleep phase, you find that there's this acute contractile dysfunction, consistent with the idea that it's leading to altered signaling. 
and indeed we get greater triglyceride, oh, uh, this is diacylglycerol and phospholipid synthesis during the sleep phase. How about chronically? So what we did here was we fed uh, mice a high-fat diet either during the sleep phase or during the awake period. When you feed them during the sleep phase, what happens is when they first presented with that high-fat diet, they eat a high-fat meal and then they go to sleep. And then you can see in black they go to sleep and then they have a little bit more high-fat when they wake up at the beginning of the active period. Whereas the animals that have the high-fat diet during the active period, they chow down all the way through the night and they, they love that high-fat diet. So you, you might think that they, the hearts might do worse here because we know chronic high-fat feeding leads to contractile dysfunction in the heart. In fact, we found the complete opposite, that heart, the animals that were eating the high-fat meal just before they went to sleep, they had poor cardiac function as shown by cardiac output and rate pressure product, and they had lower rates of oleate oxidation. They couldn't burn the fat. Instead, we believe that it was leading to altered signaling in these hearts. But humans don't eat like this typically. Well, some, some people do. They might eat uh, pizza before going to bed. But instead, we tend to eat meals. And so we tried to humanize the rodent a little bit by feeding it either high-fat breakfast or high-fat dinner. And in doing, by having a period of four-hour fasting before meal presentation, we encouraged the consumption of that diet. And you can see here that they ate equal amounts of calories from fat whether they had the high-fat breakfast or the high-fat dinner, the only variable being the time of day at which they consumed that. And we found that the animals that had the high-fat breakfast, they had greater rates of fat oxidation, and they also had better cardiac function compared to the animals that were given the high-fat dinner. And when you get rid of the clock in the heart, you completely lose this temporal difference. So really, the cardiomyocyte clock is driving the fate of those fatty acids when they are given in a time of day dependent manner. Okay, so really what I've shown you is that fatty acid consumption at the beginning of the sleep phase can lead to contractile dysfunction, whereas fatty acid consumption during the active period leads to appropriate myocardial adaptation. Okay, so this is my conclusion here that we believe that the cardiomyocyte clock is driving a whole host of processes um, within the heart, in particular metabolism, and that these oscillations in turn modulate responsiveness of the heart to various stimuli and stresses. I showed you fatty acids, but we also know it's true for um, pressure overload, also for ischemia reperfusion and other parameters in a time of day dependent manner. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the folks that have done the work, uh, and some of them are actually here in the audience. So uh, some of my collaborators, David and Jennifer Pollock, are here at this meeting. Um, also, Tammy Martino uh, is one of the speakers in this session, and Morton Thompson, uh, who is a collaborator with the electrophysiology studies. And then John Chatham, a close collaborator of mine, his postdoc is in the audience right here, uh, Helen Collins. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.